Hey, hey, everybody, welcome on into the studio. I'm Jessica Putnam Phillips, and this is Clay Share Live. Every week we bring you a fun broadcast, usually we have a tutorial and some Q&A sessions and lots and lots of fun pottery things happening here. Well, tonight we have an extra special guest. We have Michael Harbridge joining us from LearnFiredArts.com, and he is going to teach you all how to make these absolutely amazing, are you ready for it, clay puzzled ornaments and snowball lights. So these look amazing. I know I'm gonna make one, I've already decided, and I know you're gonna to wanna to make at least one too. So let's go on over to Michael and see how he's doing. Hey, Michael. Hey, Jessica, how are you? I'm great, I'm so glad you're here with us this evening. Happy to be here, appreciate it. So tell us about these clay puzzling pieces that you've got for us. So I'm going to show you guys a couple different techniques tonight. One is going to be doing the coil technique inside the molds. And these, you know, a lot of you got these sphere molds from me. Um, these are great for like garden spheres and for even just decorations, but you can do them um, in all different colors like this. And this has mother of pearl on, I'm not sure how well it shows up in the camera, but if you're looking for something you want to use overglazes on, this has mother of pearl on it. And if you want to turn it from a snowball or a sphere into an ornament, I'm going to show you how to make little caps that go on it that make it into an ornament. And I've got all different sizes that we'll be working with tonight. So I'm going to show you that coil technique. And then I'm going to show you a more solid technique with different texture. And this happens to be using a rolling pin that Kevin and Jessica might recognize. It's their snowflake rolling pin. Um, but you know, you're not just limited. There's all kinds of rolling pin textures that they've got. I've actually got a cactus, the cactus one here. And I was thinking that would be kind of cool for like a garden sphere with the cactus texture. And I know there's some new ones that Jessica's come out with that I'm really excited to get my hands on to do this technique. So I'm going to show you both of these methods. Both of these can be done as spheres, as snowballs, or again, add the ornament top to it. Um, the finishing technique on this, we won't have time tonight to go over all of the finishes on this, but I've got some extra ones fired. And tomorrow night during my Facebook Live, I'm going to go over the finishing techniques on all of these as well. And we'll talk about the glazing. We'll talk about the overglazes. Jessica's done some great tutorials on it, but I've got the white gold that I'm using on here and the gold gold um, stroke and coat. Um, and this, this can be done on all different types of clay bodies. So um, if you're working with mid-range, you're working with low fire, you can do it with, with any of those clay bodies. So I'm going to flip the camera down here and we'll start showing you how the method is done. And I'm sure Jessica will let me know if there's any questions that come up as we're going. Absolutely. So if anybody has any questions for Michael, just type them into the chat and then I will pass them along to him. If it's something he's already addressed, if, you, if someone joins late, I'll just type the answer in so we don't have to interrupt him and he can just keep going with his tutorial. Yep, all right. So this is, for those of you who are not familiar, these are clay puzzling molds and these are made with low fire earthenware bisque and they're two piece. Most of the molds are two piece. We've got some shapes that are one piece, but they're a two piece mold that come apart and there's a Velcro strap that comes with those. And we actually do the clay work. Um, what we're gonna to do tonight is gonna to be on the inside of this mold. These can also be used on the outside of the mold if you're looking for like a, a hump mold to work with or just a slump mold using half of it. You don't have to use both halves. But the cool thing about this method is you can make three dimensional shapes like this using these molds. And, and I mentioned you can do it with any clay body um, I'm working with a low fire earthenware white, but I've done the same technique with mid range. I've done it with Raku clay. I've done it with um, high fire cone 10 clay bodies as well and porcelain clay bodies. So any of them will work with this. Um, I'm going to show you first the coil technique. And I like to use um, hand extruders and there's different ones on the market. This is one that, that Kemper makes and it's a little bit longer shaft on here. You could roll the coils by hand, but once you see how many coils we're going to use, you're probably going to wish that you had one of these extruders. Now, Shimpo also makes an extruder. The silver one is the, the Nedic Shimpo um, extruder. It's a little bit shorter barrel. What some people like about that shorter barrel is that it doesn't have as much clay in there, and so it's a little bit easier to squeeze 
the clay out. Um, but I'm going to show you some tips and tricks on, on how to use both of them. And if you've got a hard time squeezing those triggers, um, I'll show you a couple different ways that you can deal with that. So I'm going to work with the Kemper one tonight just because what I like about it is it holds more clay. And when I'm doing a lot of stuff, I don't have to load the extruder as frequently. They come with different dies. Um, each one has different dies. This Kemper one, I've got a die that actually has three holes in it. And so I can get three coils of clay out that are the right diameter. And, and with this extruder, the ones that I sell um, come with this three hole die. And so when I squeeze the trigger on here, I get coils of clay out. Now, most people will hold it like this and they'll squeeze it like a gun. And that makes sense. And that works for some people. Some people have a hard time getting their hands around it if their hands aren't big enough or if they're not strong enough to squeeze that. So sometimes turning it upside down, you get a little bit better leverage this way, or, um, and I'm just gonna grab the Shimpo one to do because the plunger is pulled out on this one. If you take and you put that extruder down on the table, um, this here pulls out as a plunger and I'll show you how to load it in a little bit. Um, this is what gets squeezed when the trigger is pulled. I'll pull this out just a little bit. Um, when this trigger is squeezed, this bar moves in and this has a plate in here that pushes the clay to the end. So as I squeeze this trigger, you can see that plunger goes in. So if I have a hard time squeezing it either of those ways, if you put that plunger down on the table, wrap your hands around the top like this, and then take your hand and you can push down and you can get really good leverage. And if I stand up, you obviously can't see me standing right now, but I'm standing up and then I can really put a lot of pressure on that trigger. And the reason I wrap my hand around the top is so that when those clay coils come out of the top, they don't get caught on the edges of the extruder. They go over my hand and I don't get them stuck on the barrel of the, the gun. So whatever works for you. Sometimes when I do workshops, I'll actually put this plunger against my waist or on my belt and I'll press it against my body and then I get better leverage pulling on that. So try different things if you have a hard time with the trigger on these. Clay bodies that have a lot of sand or grog in them are gonna be a little bit harder to, to, to push through just because they're a, a harder clay body coming through on there. So one of the reasons I like the smooth earthenware clay body is there's no sand or grog in it and it's really easy to squeeze out. Don't squeeze out coils way far in advance. Um, try to do longer coils. Don't try to do little pieces of clay and think that you're gonna make a bunch of little loops. You want long continuous coils as much as you can. And you're gonna start just placing those inside the mold. Anytime I start with a coil, I always make sure that this is attached. Um, rather than just laying it in the mold and having that sitting out there, sometimes there's a little bit of a sharp point on there, the, the tip of the clay. So I always take when I start and I put that on top and pinch it into a coil. And then when I lay it in the mold, I usually start on the bottom because I'm going to work my way up the sides. And I just keep doing loops. Whoops. And if, if a coil breaks like this, it's not a big deal. Anywhere that a coil ends, you also want to lay that on top of a coil and press that down on the coil. So I'm just gonna take and continue. Anytime I start with a new coil, I have it touching and ending on top of a coil so I don't have a sharp point out there. And you want the coils to crisscross and overlap. You don't want them just butting up next to each other. Um, sometimes people try to do designs in there and they'll have the coils just looping and touching each other. You want them to cross. The more that they cross and overlap one another, the better your piece is going to hold up. I just had somebody the other day message me and she said, I, I did this piece and um, I took it out of the mold and it just collapsed. And sometimes it can be that they're taking it out a little too soon. Or a lot of times when I look at their pieces, I realize that they're just butting the coils up next to each other and they're not overlapping them. And so as I'm laying these in here, when I talk about overlapping, these are all crisscrossing, going over each other rather than just, and I'm gonna 
do a little section here, like the coils just butting up next to each other. If they're touching, when you go to take that out of the mold, the whole piece can just collapse because they're not attached to one another. You don't have to do any scoring, any slipping with this. Um, the clay, as long as it's soft and moist, you will be able to just overlap these coils. And I always tell people, if I can fit my finger into an opening, the opening's too big. I'm going to want to put another coil across there. That also is going to add to the stability of your piece. Sometimes when I'm working on real large shapes, I will periodically press these coils, which I'm going to do in just a minute here. I got a few questions when you get to a, a pausing sure. spot. Yep. So uh, some folks want to know what size sphere are you using tonight? This actually happens to be a brand new size. Um, we've oh. always had um, a seven inch. We've had a 10 and a half inch. We've had a nine inch. We've had a five inch. We've never had a six inch sphere. This is the new six inch size that fills in that spot of the, um, the spheres that we have. Fantastic. And then someone wants to know if they were going to make one of these to hang on their tree, what size sphere would you recommend? So there's the smallest one is like two and a half inches, and then it goes up to three inches. And, and on our website, we have them listed as like two to three inch and like three to four inch, because sometimes when the clay shrinks in firing, it might shrink to a little bit less than three inches. And if we list it as a three inch, somebody will be upset about it. But also keep in mind, and, and those measurements we usually do on the inside of the mold. So keep in mind, you're going to be working on the inside with clay. So while your piece may be a three inch sphere, when it's wet clay, you got to think about it's going to shrink as it dries. And most clay bodies are going to shrink in firing. So I would probably go with um, the one that's like the, the three and a half, three to three and a half inch is a, is a really good size to work with if you're doing an ornament. There is one size smaller that's like a two and a half to three inch size. This one is a great size, but they will be smaller ornaments. So I would say either of these are good. You go bigger than this and you're gonna get some pretty heavy ornaments hanging on your tree. <laughs> and these and then, are, you know, the, this one that I did, this sample, this was done with the seven to eight inch sphere. And this is, an, this is too big for a tree ornament. This is more of a decorative piece to have sitting around. Yeah, that's a nice piece to have just, you know, sitting on a credenza or um, a fireplace mantle. So we have a mm -hmm. question. Um, sometimes this person gets air pockets in the clay when they're extruding it through their extruder, even after they wedge it. Do you have any suggestions on ways to prevent this from happening? Yeah, so when you go to load the extruder, and let me just pull out the, the simple one here. I was going to show you guys loading once I emptied that one, but I'll actually show you with the shimpo one. So when you load it, how you put the tube of clay in there. Some people will pull off pieces of clay and cram it in there and then they get some air pockets or they make the coil too small to fit inside and they get more air. So I'll, I'll show you guys the loading process. So the loading process on any of these extruders, there is a trigger that you push in and then you have to pull this plunger out. And sometimes this makes a bad squeaky sound um, as I pull it out. So forgive me if, if we get that. A lot of times I will stand up and pull at my side to get um, that plunger pulled back. So I'm taking it off the screen here for a minute. So I'm just pulling it back part way, but that opens up the inside where we're gonna drop the clay in. So when you create your coil of clay, you wanna try to create this so that it is small enough to fit down inside the tube, but you don't want it to be so small that you have a lot of air. So like this is a little bit too big that I can't get that in there. So I'm just gonna pinch that bottom a little bit more and try to slide this in. Because if you, if you squeeze this real thin and it goes in real easily, you've got a lot of air all the way around on there. So I'm gonna take that, push that in and try to squish that down and eliminate as much air as possible. Now, as you start squeezing that, a lot of times you'll get a little bit of air at first that, that kind of makes its way out and you may hear a popping. Sometimes I joke in workshops that it kind of sounds like there's a gun um, shooting 
that it can be a little bit load. Um, but that will eliminate a lot of your air pockets inside there. What you definitely don't want to do is take a whole bunch of little pieces of clay and jam them all in there individually because you're going to get air pockets between all of those pieces and you will have constant popping in there. So try to make that coil so that it fits in nice and snug and you'll get less air inside there. Set that one out of the way here. So while I while Jessica was asking that question, I started taking and pressing the clay in here. And so what I use is just a dry washcloth. And you can use a sponge, you can use any, you can use your fingers to press. What I find is sometimes people who have long fingernails, they're cutting into those coils with their fingernails. So a towel is nice to kind of wrap around your fingers and press down. The reason I really like using the towel and the washcloth is because it has texture. So as I press those coils, you can see the texture in those coils. And when I'm doing workshops, people always ask, you know, do I have this pressed enough? And it's easy for me to go around. And if I can see that little bit of texture in the coil, and then I see areas where there isn't any texture, I know that where there isn't any texture, they haven't pressed. And so I'll usually say, you know, press those areas that look smooth. And you don't want to press so hard that you flatten the coils into pancakes. Um, because if they get too thin, they're really fragile. So you're just pressing hard enough to compress those coils so they stick to one another, but not so hard that they become paper thin. You don't want paper thin. Um, if I see an area where the coils don't have texture, a lot of times I'll take my finger and I'll kind of roll the coil back and I'll show them and I'll be like, you know, look at here where it's real smooth, you don't have the coil pressed hard enough and look at how easily it comes apart. So if you're concerned, you can just kind of take your finger, pick at the coil. If they don't come apart, you should be good. You don't have to worry about going exactly right to the edge of this, but you may end up with a few little areas like this where you've got some, some big spaces, or I mentioned earlier, if I can stick my finger into an opening, it's probably too big. So at that point, you wanna go back and add a few more coils. And this is where you might get some smaller pieces of coil that um, will just be filling in those spots. Um, I mentioned earlier, longer continuous coils are better than breaking them into little pieces. But here where I need to just fill in, I can loop this coil around. Um, I also look for long narrow spaces. This spot right here, I can't necessarily fit my finger in there, but if they're long and skinny, I want to have a coil going across the middle of that to make that more stable there. So I'm going to go through, fill in any of these spots. And then on the very bottom, I want to do several extra coils because this piece is going to stand. This will be the bottom of the piece. If I just have one loop sticking out like this, it's going to be really fragile. So I'm going to add a bunch of coils on the very bottom. And usually about three to four strips like this. And then I pressed it with a towel to attach them, attach all those little pieces that I just filled in with. And this side looks pretty good. I don't see any big openings. The bottom looks nice and strong. So I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side. And if you've got any questions, Jessica, now would be a good time to Yeah, so some those. folks are asking, how do you clean your extruder? <laughs> That's a really good question. I rarely <laughs> I do. <laughs> just keep it full of clay all the time. And they're always- Yeah, using. no, you, you don't wanna keep it full of clay because I have had times where I do a project and I forget to, to squeeze the rest of the clay out. And then like two weeks later, I go to do something and the clay is hard as a rock in there and it's a little bit harder to clean out. But I generally just extrude all the clay out and the little bit of clay that's left in there will just dry up. And then the next time when I go to use it, I open the extruder and that dried up, those little pieces of clay that are in there just crumble and fall out. And I just kind of tap the sides of the extruder and get that dried up clay out of the inside. You can take it apart and you can run water through the tube um, if you wanna make sure that it's good and clean. Obviously, if you're gonna go with different types of clay bodies, 
you're going to want to wash it out. And so when you go to take the extruder apart, and I've got a brand new one here because I knew somebody would ask about that. So there's basically threaded parts on both ends. And so I can take this end off and the plunger is all the way at the end. When I pull this, whoops, when I pull this plunger all the way back, let me just do that here. So I've got the plunger pulled all the way back. That opens up that tube. If there's clay inside here, I can run water in there and do it, or I can just go like this and screw off the other end pull this apart in my tube, I can just throw this in the sink or run water through it, stick a sponge inside there or a scrub brush inside to clean that out. And then the only other part that's really gonna have clay is your plunger part. And so that too, you can just wash off, um, swish it in water, clean that off, and then put your extruder back together. I can put this back on, this is threaded, tighten that. Put the other end down and the different dies that come with it. This Kemper one comes with three different hole dies. There's just single holes. And when I first started doing this method, the small die that came with this one is about the size that I'm working with here, but I only get one coil out where the, the die that I have, we actually take this blank die and we drill three holes in it. So we get three coils out that size. It's a third of the squeezing of the trigger. So um, that comes with it, but then you just drop whatever die you're working with into the end and that threaded part goes on to the end and your extruder is ready to use. And we did have a question someone wants to know, how would you attach two spheres together to make a snowman? That sounds like another tutorial to me. I that actually, like I have done the, the snowman Do and the way that I do that is I make the individual sphere shapes, the clay shapes, I take them out of the mold and I let them, I, I kind of set them together to make sure they fit together and that they kind of have indentations where they're gonna to fit together. But then I set them aside and let them dry because when you start building tall snowmen, um, it gets a little heavy when you've got three spheres that you've stacked up on top of each other in the wet clay form. So I usually let them dry separately and I glue them together either after I fire them or if I glaze them, I stack them together in the glaze firing and just let the glaze fuse them together. Fantastic. I'm doing the same thing on this half of the mold, just putting my coils in. I'm gonna look for the small spaces. Anywhere that a coil starts and stops, I make sure that it's on top of another coil. And then we're gonna do one thing different with this side. Once we have this all filled in where it needs to be filled in, and we're gonna create loops so that we can attach these two halves together. I'm pressing with the towel. And people always ask, should the towel be dry or wet? Um, I keep it dry. If your towel is wet, your clay tends to want to stick to it and you get your clay really wet and squishy and you don't want to add more moisture to the clay. Just filling in areas where I've got big openings. I'm gonna press this. I'm gonna add a couple of coils on the bottom and then we're gonna create the loops so that we can attach the two halves. And you, when you do this, you don't want to create these loops with your first half that you do. So I've got the first half that I did. I set it aside. The clay does not go above the edge of the mold on that one. This one, same thing. It's not going above the edge of the mold. I'm adding my extra coils on the bottom for strength. And then I'm gonna do loops. If you do these loops too early and you set this aside, the loops tend to dry out too much. And then when we do the next step that I'm gonna show you, um, that can be a problem when we go to bend these in. So I'm creating loops that are gonna stick up about an inch and I'm gonna go all the way around this mold. Again, trying to do long continuous coils of clay 
not breaking off and making individual little loops. This is going to add to your, your strength. If I go higher than an inch with these loops, it can be a problem because we're going to bend these in to put the two halves together and they will get a little top heavy if we make them too high. And you'll see that when I go to bend these in in a minute. All right, so I've got the loops sticking up all the way around. The area where the opening, the hole is in here, um, I do not have any coils there because that's where we're gonna go inside to press the two halves together. But I wanna go around and I wanna gently press each of these so they're attached well. And then to be able to put the other half of the mold on there, I need to bend these inward because if I put the mold on, they're gonna get caught and squished between. And so this is where, if I go too high with these, higher than an inch, as I bend them in, they get real top heavy and they wanna break and fall into the inside. So don't go too tall. And I mentioned not adding these loops on until kind of the last thing before you're ready to put the mold together. Because if I do these on the first half of the mold and then I go and I fill in the second half, these loops might get dry. And as I bend them in, they wanna crack and break off. And I usually line the mold up so that the pour, the opening is on the, the very bottom. When I go to put the other half on there, I kind of wrap my fingers around it. So as I turn this over, that clay doesn't flop out. Um, sometimes depending how dry your clay is, your clay may want to flop out. So if you hold your fingers on there as you flip it over, and then as I set it down, I just gently slide my fingers out, let the mold go together. And then that Velcro strap wraps around the mold. And really I kind of hold it with these two fingers, the strap with these fingers. And then I bring that other strap around and I pull it really nice and tight so that that mold goes together. Now on the inside, some of the molds you can get your fingers inside to kind of press those loops, but I obviously can't get my hand inside of this one. So we have a press tool. And there's two different ends. There's a foam ball end that's larger and there's a wood ball end. And then there's an optional flashlight on here that's Velcroed on. And I can take and put that light so that when I go inside that mold, the light shines straight down inside there. When I first started doing this, I got one of those minor lights and had it on my head. But then as I was teaching workshops, I'd look up to say something and I was blinding half of the people in the class. And so this way the light is shining down inside and you can kind of see in the camera there. And what I'm doing is I'm just going and I'm pressing now those coils to the other half of the mold. I'm not dragging the tool, I'm just kind of going like this and poking as I make my way around um, inside the mold to attach those to the other half of the mold. And I'll go over that a couple times Again, I don't want to press so hard that I flatten the coils out paper thin. And then I'll usually, where that joint is in the mold, you know, I added extra coils on each half of this, but there's usually a little spot right in where that seam line is. And I'll just take a little extra clay and kind of press that into that spot to add some strength right in that area. And then I should be able to just take the Velcro strap off of the mold and gently kind of wiggle that half of the mold and open it up. And I've got my sphere. What I look for is along the seam line that I've pressed hard enough that those coils have come out to the edge of the mold. Sometimes right along that seam line, if you don't press hard enough with the tool, you have kind of a dip in there. And so I usually look at that and if I see a dip anywhere, then I can take the mold and I can easily put it back together. I can put the strap on and I can go back in with the tool and press in those areas. I don't see any areas on here where it looks like I've got any dips. So this is good. Now I can't take this out and stand it up at this point with this larger size because this clay is really soft and wiggly. So I'll usually leave it in half the mold and let that dry. Sometimes I'll put it in front of a fan just to firm up the bottom of it so that I can take and pop it out of the mold. But when I'm ready to pop it out of the mold, 
I usually just put it over into my other hand and then I lift that half off and you've got your sphere. Sometimes on the bottom, you'll have a little bump of clay here and I'll just take and either scrape that off or bend that down. Again, this piece, normally I wouldn't take it out when it's this soft, but I wanna be able to show you guys what to do with that. And then I'll look where the seam line of the mold was. And sometimes you'll get a little bump of clay there and I can just take my finger and smooth that out. Or I can take like a metal rib or a wooden tool and I can gently scrape that stuff away. I can also wait till it's dry and I can smooth it out after it's dry. Um, and use a little bit of water to smooth it. I generally don't put a lot of water out on the tables because people tend to be dipping their finger in and they're just totally saturating the piece with water when it's wet clay and it, it makes it really soft. But um, if you do happen to take the piece out and it's too soft to stand on its own, like I can take this and I actually, I can stand this up and as long as I don't bump the table, this piece will be fine. But if I'm worried that it's gonna collapse, I can always take it and just put it back into half of the mold. And it's safer to let it dry in half of the mold for a little while. I could leave this in here overnight. There's nowhere for this to catch as it shrinks that it's gonna crack or do anything crazy. Um, but usually I'll put it in front of a fan for 10, 15 minutes and it's usually firm enough to take out at that point. All right, any questions on the coil method? No, I think uh, so, so folks were asking about you don't need to slip and score because they were taught that way. But with this method, you don't have to. Right. And the nice thing with this is you don't have to slip and score as long as the clay is moist enough. If you've got a really dry, groggy clay, um, you know, you may have to. But I, I have not in all the years that I've been doing this, I've never used any slip or any water or anything inside the mold. And then we had one comment that um, this person's clay dries out really fast while they're trying to work in the molds. Do you have any suggestions on how they can keep the first half moist or from drying out while they're working on the second half? That's a good question. Um, you can work faster or you could put like a plastic bag or something over the top of it. Um, I wouldn't dampen the mold. I don't think that would be a good idea, but I would say like a plastic bag over it. Um, the mold will absorb moisture from the clay. Um, so just try to work quickly as you're doing it. Um, the coils tend to dry out a little bit faster um, than you know the solid technique, which I'm going to show you guys next. All right. So now I've got the um, seven, eight inch sphere here and, and I've got half of it already ready, but I'm going to show you guys doing um, the texture, the, the snowflake texture or whatever texture you want to do. I've done these with the bark texture for garden spheres and they're really cool. And you, some of those stoneware glazes um, that break on sharp edges look really cool on the bark textures. So we're going to do snowflakes today, but again, there's lots of different textures out there that you can work with. So you want to start out by breaking off pieces of clay, kind of flattening them a little bit. They don't have to be the exact same shape. They don't need to be round. They don't have to be real particular. We're just breaking off pieces of clay and flattening them a little bit. And then we're gonna take the rolling pin and I've got the snowflake rolling pin and we're gonna roll over these pieces to add the texture. When I originally started playing around with this idea, I started with a slab of clay and I rolled my rolling pin across it and got the texture on the entire slab. And then I started breaking it apart. But what I found was as I was breaking it apart, my fingers were wrecking some of the texture and the pattern in there. So I started just taking and tearing off pieces of clay and then rolling the rolling pin on it to pick up that texture. And so I don't want these to all be perfectly square or perfectly round, all different shapes and sizes. If you think back to um, when you would roll a, a snowball to make a snowman, and you know you'd have like that perfectly round shape, and then you'd get into kind of some wet snow. And as you continued to roll, your snowball got a little uneven, and then you had to turn it on the side the other way to kind of get it to even out. 
it's kind of the same thing with this. You don't have to have this being perfectly smooth. You actually want that texture. And if you look, I'll hold this up again, you can see all the texture between all of these pieces. So I've got bigger pieces, I've got smaller pieces, I've got longer, narrower pieces. It's okay to have them all being different shapes and sizes. So don't, some people are just really particular and they're like, oh, you know, these need to be perfectly square or they need to all look the same. They really don't. What you basically want is, you know, the thickness, you want the thickness to be similar between all of them. And, and work with different parts of the rolling pin so you get different um, snowflake patterns in those pieces. See if I've got enough clay in this bag, or I might have to open another bag of clay here. I probably will have to flatten these out a little bit. So yeah, I don't use the exact same spot on the rolling pin for every one. So you get a good variety of all the cool snowflake patterns. And if you mess up and you don't like it, just flip it over and use the other side. And if you still don't like it, ball it up, wedge it, reuse it. All right. So then on the inside of the mold, we're gonna take and we're gonna set these pieces of clay down on the inside with the texture facing down. Because remember when we take the mold apart, it's gonna expose the clay on the outside. And I want these pieces to overlap each other a little bit. They don't need to overlap a ton. And I'm gonna work from the bottom and work my way out, laying these pieces inside. And now on the first half, I did this one before we got started tonight. Um, I went up to kind of the seam line. If the clay comes over, I'm just gonna kind of squish that down a little bit. And if I've got some bigger areas like this, I'll take smaller pieces like this and put them on and attach them. But if I've got some areas that are not real even and there's a little bit of an opening, it's okay because instead of doing loops on here like we did with the coil technique, we're actually gonna take pieces and we're gonna have them sticking up like this. So if I've got a little area like this that isn't filled in, that piece is gonna come over and it's gonna attach on here. If I cut this in, or I fill it in right up to that seam line, when we take it out of the mold, there is gonna be a perfect line along this part of the, the finished clay piece. And it's gonna to look too perfect, like a straight line. So you want some unevenness with this. So leave some openings here and there because these pieces that stick up are gonna overlap and you'll get a better design in the end. Let me get a, another bag of clay open here. At the last minute, I knew I was going to be cutting it close with that bag of clay. And I was like, oh, I better grab another bag. So I don't have to run off camera in the middle. That's fine. While you're doing that, I'm going to let everybody know a couple things. One, Michael has uh, generously donated a $100 gift certificate for his shop at learnfiredarts.com that we're gonna be giving away tonight. So one lucky winner is gonna get that. And we are gonna be doing giveaways all month long from Michael. So thank you, Michael, for doing that and being the sponsor for November here at Clay Share. And then the other thing is if you go on over to learnfiredarts.com, that's Michael's site, he has some specials and promos going on. So you can go over there and check out what he's got and uh, you know maybe get some early Christmas shopping done. All right, that That'd was my great. little Thank plug. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we'll have specials all month long and I tried today to get most of the specials up there, but um, each week we'll add some new things. We've got some new products coming in, got some new molds. I'll show you guys tonight what we're gonna be using next week. Um, and I've got some other projects that I'm working on, some really cool new trees we're going to do later this month. We're going to do packages next week. All right, so I've got all of the pieces laid in here. Now, we're not going to take the towel and press with this because what's going to happen if we do that? If we press real hard, we're going to lose all of that snowflake texture. So rather than pressing, I'm just going to take my finger 
and I'm just going to kind of drag it where those pieces overlap and squish them together. I shouldn't say squish, more mashing them together. I don't want to press real hard. I just want to take my finger and drag across where they overlap one another and make sure that they are attached well. Now there's a technique I did a, a long time ago and I haven't done it recently where instead of filling it in solid with pieces, I'd leave openings in there. And I think that would be cool with this too, especially if you're gonna light these, to have openings between these pieces would give you even more openings for light using the snowflake pattern or whatever pattern you decide to do. It's too bad you don't have many options for them, Jessica, with all the rolling I know. pins. If only. <laughs> so those, are, those of you who don't know, I'll share that too. ClayshareMarket.com is where the rolling pin came from. And we have uh, many other designs on there as well. All right, so I've got all the pieces sticking up on here. And again, I don't want them to be perfectly straight either. I want it to be kind of uneven. But again, I need to bend these in like we did with the coils so that they don't get caught between the two halves. I will again wrap my fingers around the edge. So as I flip this over, I don't have to worry about that clay flopping out. And, and if you do get like, so let's say I did this and the clay flopped out and I'm just gonna pull this piece out. So the piece flopped out and oh my gosh, it's laying on here and it's not lined up and you're panicking. Rather than panic and try to lift this piece up and put it back into the mold, it's usually best to set the mold on top of it. And then you can actually move the piece around on the inside rather than trying to pick it up and move it. If I do it this way, I can take, and I'm just pressing my body against this, and I can, with my hand, I can move that piece inside to position it. Um, and I didn't do that very well. Now I've got this totally turned around. I see the bottom is actually over here there. All right, so I can take that, I can set that on there, put the Velcro strap around the mold. Well, that's one for the other mold. I got too many Velcro straps here. And then I can go into the inside. Now I'm gonna use my finger to get the, the flaps that are close to the top here. And then I'll take the tool and on the inside. And with this one, instead of pressing straight down, I'm gonna take the tool and I'm going to kind of go like this and just kind of squish that clay, kind of like I did with my finger, but I'm using the, the foam ball on this to squish and drag that clay. Again, I don't wanna to press too hard or I'll lose all my texture and my snowflakes, but I want to drag that clay over to attach the two halves. And the nice thing with this deep texture like this with these pieces is like with the coil technique, when I talked about when I opened it up and I always looked for dips in there, because you've got so much texture in here, you really don't notice if there are dips unless if they're really, really, really deep along that edge. And like here, let's see if we can get that in the the camera. So you can see that that's where the pieces meet up. But because I didn't do a straight perfect line of clay, you don't really even notice where that seam line was on the piece. Again, I wouldn't normally take it out when it's this wet, but just to be able to show you guys, I'm going to take that out. And you can see all of the texture. Now there's a little bit of clay here that got caught. Whoops, get it in the camera here that got caught between the mold. I can just take and kind of pull that away. I could take a little tool and smooth out those imperfections, but I like all of that deep texture where all of those pieces meet up. And I didn't press too hard that I lost my snowflake design on these pieces. And I'm laughing because there's actually glitter. You probably can't see it in the camera. <laughs> when I was doing my backdrop here, I had gone to um, Hobby Lobby and picked up a bunch of picks and some glittery balls and ornaments and stuff. And as I was setting up today, I was like, oh my gosh, I have glitter 
everywhere. And then I kind of rubbed my face. I had an itch on my nose and my nose was sparkling and I'm sure none of us have experienced that. So I'm now that, that I've got it in, in half of the mold, um, I can decide if I want to put holes in it. If I want to light this one up, I can put holes in and, and I put a couple little plastic lights in here for those of you who've done the ceramic Christmas trees and you use the little plastic pin lights, you can actually light this up. And so I'm using a, a hole puncher here. And these come in, there's a couple different types of punches. There are ones like this that have the enclosed punch. And then there are the semicircle ones like this that are have a sharper point, but they're only enclosed halfway. There are advantages to both of these. Um, for this particular piece, I just use the smaller one to the set, like they come in a set of four different ones. There's, this is the small one. There's, or, I'm sorry, it's a set of five. Um, I'm using the smallest one for this, but if you wanted to go with bigger lights, you could. And in the middle of the snowflakes then, I'm just taking this and I'm piercing a hole into the middle of the snowflakes. And like here, where it's kind of a joint, there's kind of snowflakes on both sides. So I'm just gonna poke a hole in the middle there. You don't have to do the holes in here if you don't want. When there's a half a snowflake like this, I'm like, well, that would be about the middle there. I'm gonna poke a hole there and just go along and poke. Now, the with this type of a hole punch, usually that clay piece is still in there, but it will pop loose. And so after the clay dries, or if you want to do it now, you can take a needle tool and you can go in and just pop that little piece out. The advantage to the semicircle hole cutters, and this one, because it's a bigger opening, I'm not going to use it in here, but I'll use it in a slab of clay here. If I use this semicircle one, it's a matter of poking it in and then I have to twist it. And then when I pull it out, well, usually <laughs> the clay comes out and it kind of sticks in the tool. If I have a thinner piece, this is really thick. Let me flatten this out. If I poke it in and I twist it, when I pull it out, usually the clay stays in the tool and I can sit there and do a bunch of those holes before I just take my finger and I go like that and I flick the clay off and continue to do my holes in there. Um, these with, with school kids and younger kids, these are really sharp and pointy. You don't want them probably using them. Um, adults, these work great. Um, these better with younger artists, but the needle tools are just as dangerous. So kind of know who you're working with if you're working with somebody else to do that. So I can go and I can poke the holes in and that's how, and then this too, I let it set in half of the mold until it firms up enough that it can stand on its own. Let's set this one aside. So we you did have a question. Did you add more clay for the base of the snowflake ball than you did on the ornament ball? At the, at the base at the bottom of it, you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I didn't because this is solid clay. I wasn't worried about adding more clay to the bottom. The reason I do it with the coil ones is because when you just have one little individual coil sticking out and you go to set it down in greenware, um, it tends to break off. And so that's why I usually added more coils around the bottom on the coil technique. On the solid technique, not as concerned about that because you've got solid clay there already. All right, so the ornament tops, I've got different sizes here based on the different size ornaments that I did. So this bigger one I did was for the seven, eight inch one. And I didn't attach these on here so that I could show you guys using them as snowballs or using them as ornaments. But when I go down to the smaller sizes, the size of these goes down. And for the real small one, that's using this one. So depending on the, the size ornament that you're doing will determine how big of a piece of clay you start out with. But we're basically gonna make like a pinch pot. And so I will kind of make um, almost like a tube of clay. And then I do my pinch pot just by sticking my thumb inside and kind of working my way around and opening that piece up. Let 
And I want to get it so that it's somewhat uniform wall thickness on here. So I don't have areas that are super thick and areas that are super thin. And then on the outside of the piece, I'll usually just take my thumb and I kind of have a couple fingers on the inside. And then I just run my thumb down the outside with those fingers supporting on the inside to kind of smooth this. A lot of times after it's dry, I'll go over it with a damp sponge to smooth it more. This one is gonna be for probably about a 10 inch ornament, but I can take my needle tool and I can cut off part of this because I don't need this much for this size ornament. And then a lot of times I'll take to flatten this top, I'll just take and press it down on my surface and I'm using my thumb to kind of work my way around on the inside to make sure that that clay is, um, that I don't have thick edges in there. And it also helps to flatten that top. I won't be too particular with the smoothing, but I usually spend quite a bit of time smoothing this with my thumb or like I said, with a damp sponge later. But then I'll go and I will pinch this bottom so that it flares out. And you can get as fancy with these as you want. I had thought about, you know, I looked at um, a real ornament and some of them had pretty ornate designs in that cap. I thought about cutting some scallops in the edge of this. I mean, you can get as fancy with this as you want. Um, you could add texture to this with different stamps and things like that if you wanted, but I'm just gonna leave this kind of smooth. And then for my loop on the top, I can either roll a coil by hand or I still have some clay in the extruder. I'm gonna extrude out coil here and I'll decide, you know, how big I want that loop to be. I'll break that off and then I kind of taper the ends of this. And then I will use one of my hole punches. And this is where I like this semicircle one because I'll actually go into the top of this and I will cut out a hole and go right across from that and cut out another hole. And you can see the clay sticks in the tool. I just slide my finger across to, to knock that off. And then with the ends of this tapered, they will fit inside of that opening. And I would normally put a little bit of slip inside of that opening to attach this and then just make sure that it's got a nice rounded shape to it. Um, if I wanted to stick a piece of paper towel or something in there, you know, I could do that. And I will um, then set this on my rounded shape to make sure that it kind of follows the contour of that shape and that my flaring out on here is enough so that it fits on there. I'm not worried about it being in the exact spot. I just wanna make sure that it fits that rounded shape. And then I will set that aside let that dry, let these pieces dry. Um, I will fire them and then do my decorating on them. All right, any other questions at this point, Jessica? So uh, we had some folks asking if you sell your, your forms anywhere other than on your website. Um, I do not. Um, I've had a few um, studios out there over the years that have, have sold them in their stores, but I don't think that anybody else has them on their website currently. And when you do trade shows, uh, do you take the, your inventory with you? Do you sell them there too? Yeah, so, so like in Sika, last mm -hmm. year I did not do in Sika, um, but in past years when I've done in Sika, I usually have um, inventory there that, that people can pick up and the sphere molds it's one of our best selling molds and we always had those we sold them in sets and we always had a, a convention special on those um, and we've got a special right now on our website and there's free shipping in the us 48 on 50 dollar or greater orders 
We ship to Hawaii and Alaska as long as they fit in a flat rate shipping box. So up to a large flat rate shipping box um, is free shipping in Hawaii and Alaska as well. And we do ship internationally. Um, some of the locations are more costly than others, but that is an option. Our website will calculate the actual shipping on those, those packages. I made a question. Have you ever made a rattle with this technique? That that's a really good question. I haven't done a rattle, but I did bells. So I did like jingle bells. And so I did the round shape and then I cut out the kind of the opening like a jingle bell would have on it. And I put a ball of clay in there. So it actually would jingle. It didn't really jingle very well. It kind of made more of a thudding sound, but it looked really <laughs> cool. <laughs> so it was kind of a rattly sound, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm so not trying to make a rattle rab for a baby. You're going <laughs> to you're in seek you're going to be at Nsika in 2023. Yep. In Cincinnati. I will be there. Yes. Yep. All right. That's right. He said it. So now we have to hold him to it. We got to be there. Oh yeah. I I was sad <laughs> I I couldn't make it last year, but there were circumstances that prevented me from being there last year. So yeah. um, we will be prepared. We're actually starting to make stuff now in anticipation of in anticipation of Inseca. And that is that is a huge, huge, very busy conference. So it's a great conference. If you, if you haven't been there before, you want to be there. Yeah, definitely. If you've never gone. All right. So um, we're getting close to wrapping up for the evening because it's almost can you believe it's almost six o'clock already. I know. Happen? Goes fast. It's so fast. So so fast. So um, folks are asking about discounts and deals on Michael's products. If you go to learnfiredarts.com, you will see he's got a whole bunch of promos right now. So you can check those all out. Well, Michael, Michael, thank you so much again, as always. I can't wait to see what you do for us next week. Um, remember, next week we're going to be on Tuesday, not Wednesday. Right. So mark your calendars, folks, right now. So the Wednesday live is actually Tuesday live. There will not be a Wednesday. So, yeah. oh, yeah, these are that's the, next week's. This is next week's surprise. Week we're going to be working with the, the packages. We've got new oh, tall, yeah. narrow packages. The packages. Very yeah. exciting. So I'll, you guys will have to tune in next week for that. All right, Michael, thank you very much for another wonderful demo and fun evening. Lots of ideas. I got lots of ideas. Thank you. Did you want to draw for the? Did you I'm going to draw. The draw? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do the drawing. You want to hang out there? Michael's going to hang out there. We'll come back to me and I'll announce the winner. And then Michael can chime in. Yay! Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> Check out learnfiredarts.com. Again, Michael has generously donated gift certificates. Tonight we're giving away a $100 um, worth of products from Michael's site. That's learnfiredarts.com. And you can get um, great deals all month long for the month of November since he is the sponsor of ClayShare. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to announce the winner because we're short on time. I got three minutes to get out of here. So um, the winner. For tonight's $100 gift certificate to Learn Fired Arts from Michael Harbridge is, no drum roll, but Pat McNeil. Pat McNeil, congratulations. You have won yourself $100 to spend with Michael. Uh, you're going to have a lot of fun with that. I know it. So if you've been making a list, now's the time to get what you've been um, putting on that list. And we're going to have next Tuesday, again, Michael back with us to do another giveaway great discounts and another fabulous tutorial. Thank you, Michael, for being here with us tonight. Um, thanks, you too. Uh, now, I'm gonna be doing a tutorial next for my premium members of ClayShare. We are gonna be doing colored clay. So if you ever wanna know how to make your very own colored clay, which you could make and then use in Michael's puzzle molds, they'd already be colored, right? You could put it in your extruder and extrude out your colored coils. So I'm gonna teach everybody how to use mason stains. Last week we did marbled clay. This week we're gonna do colored clay, um, which is really exciting. And don't forget, next week we will be here on a Tuesday. Actually, I think we're doing Tuesday and then Wednesday and then Tuesday. We're flipping around a little bit for the month of November. There's a lot going on here. So we've had to adjust the schedule, but we'll post that uh, at least a week in advance so you guys can find that. All right, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. The replay will be available shortly. Premium members, I will see you in a few minutes. Bye, everybody.